Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Meeting House again today. I'm your host, Dwight A. Moody, coming to you from our studio in Hendersonville, North Carolina. It's a cool, damp, rainy day outside. We've gotten the tail end of all of those storms that swept across Alabama and Georgia. I hope all of you are safe, and I'm safe as long as I stay inside, where at least it's warm. But we welcome you to our conversation on religion and American life today. There is so much going on in the country right now, so much to talk about, and we're going to cover as much as we can today. As always, I've got five, four news stories today. We'll be talking about each one of them. At the end of the show, at the end of the hour, I have version two of my commentary. I wrote a commentary last week entitled, Houston, We Have a Problem, and then decided to revise it. And uh, now I call it Trading for Trump. It's about what's going on in the Southern Baptist Convention with the defections. I call it Trading for Trump. And that'll be at the end of the show. My guest today had advertised as Winterborn Jones, one of the young preachers I've worked with for the last 12 years, but we have rescheduled him for two weeks down the road, and I'm delighted that my friend, the Rabbi Mark Gopin, is here to talk to me today about uh, all that's happened, especially what's happened in Atlanta yesterday. We woke up to this terrible news uh, about uh, the, the violence this, this young man um, killing these women. And uh, we're going to talk about that today. Uh, Mark has been involved in anti-violence initiatives and organizing all around the world. And uh, goodness knows we need as much of it here in the United States as uh, most countries do uh, around the world. And we're, and we're going to talk about this in just a, a few minutes. But as always, I'm going to start with the news. Uh, I've got these stories brought to you by, um, as you know, my former students out in California who have this coffee business, PerfectoCoffeeInc.com. Mark, let's go over the news, and we're going to start in Rome. Uh, neither Mark nor I are Catholics, but we do watch very carefully what goes on in the Catholic world and listen to what the Pope says because it's very influential ar around the world. American Catholics are responding to a document issued by the Vatican, which in turn was a response to questions raised by Catholics concerning gay marriage. Priests are not allowed, the document said, to bless homosexual marriages for the same reason they cannot bless or officiate at marriages of people who are divorced and remarried or remarried or sexually active outside of marriage. Marianne Duddy Burke, who is the executive director of an organization called Dignity USA, said her organization's membership includes same-sex couples who have been together for decades. Quote, the fact that our church is at its highest levels cannot recognize the grace in that and cannot extend any sort of blessing to these couples is just tragic, she said. Two related developments, the yet-to-be-published authorized biography of the late Protestant pastor and translator Eugene Peterson. You remember he was the author of that version of the Bible called The Message, very popular. The new biography of the late uh, Eugene Peterson presents evidence that Peterson came at last at the end of his life to understand homosexual orientation and behavior as given at birth and not intrinsically sinful. And a group of black, domestic, uh, black Protestant pastors wrote the Senate Judiciary Committee of their support 
for wide ranging civil rights for LBGTQ persons, but asked the committee to consider additional legislation that would protect religious groups and their organizations from being forced to embrace the new homosexual ethic or lose federal benefits. Mark, what do you think about this? What, uh, what is the attitude in the Jewish community toward homosexual marriage? Mark, I'm not sure we can hear you. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. sorry. There, there you go. All right. Let's try to be very quiet and <laughs> myself on silent. Uh, you know, silence is golden, but that's right. Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so I, um, I basically uh, have been working in world religions around the world for 30 years, and in addition to to the Jewish community uh, that I've grown up in. And we know that this is one of the most uh, divisive issues of, mm. of, of all time, and it's created schisms in all the major religious yes. traditions around the world. In the Jewish community, the largest denomination, Reform Judaism, has openly accepted um, gay rabbis and gay marriage, and, and uh, so have other denominations, but not, not the Orthodox. In many ways, the Orthodox is parallel to the Catholic world, mm -hmm. where we know this pope slowly and steadily uh, has emphasized the importance of inclusivity and love of homosexual community. Um, but, but the sacrament of marriage is that sacrosanct place that, 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 that he's not, that he and the Vatican are not allowing that to go into. And that, that's a very, you know, we have to think about sacraments and marriage and understand that marriage as a blessing that's blessed through religious traditions, it, it's kind of the, it's kind of owned by everybody. And yeah. so it's more of a, it's going to cause more schism than say just welcoming and loving and even treating a homosexual people as equals. Sacraments are difficult and they do create schism. So I am sad today for uh, homosexual members of the Catholic community who feel uh, very traumatized by the announcement. And we've seen, uh, you know, they have helplines and such. And every time these announcements come, people people get very sad and they need to call helplines. And, you know, it's a billion people who identify as Catholic. Right. For right. me, I look at it in a longitudinal way, that this is a slow and steady embrace of the fact that billions of people now feel God doesn't make mistakes. If somebody's born a certain way, they are beloved. They are created in the image of God. And therefore, our, our traditions and customs need to adjust. Uh, I just, there was a wonderful testimony in Missouri today from a, a parent, a very, very Christian parent of a transgender. Yes, uh, I saw it. Beautiful testimony that God doesn't make mistakes. My child is not a mistake. Very touching. So yeah. I think we have to be patient with the fact that this is a very difficult, sacred thing to many people, and yet it's very clear that it's changing, and the world it, is changing in that direction. It, it is indeed. Okay, from Cambridge and Memphis, two deaths to report today. John Pokinghorn, a name familiar to some of you, was a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Cambridge in England, until 1979, when he resigned that position to become a priest in the Anglican Church. He was ordained in 1982. An elegant and prolific writer, Pokinghorn authored over 30 books, exploring in rigorous depth the relationship between the discoveries of modern physics and the doctrines of his Christian faith. He received the Templeton Prize in 2002 in recognition of his modern and compelling treatment of theology as a complement to natural science. And in Memphis, memorial services will be held for Larry Walker, the last living translator of the original team of scholars that produced the very popular and widely used New International Version of the Bible. Walker was a Hebrew scholar and a Semitic languages specialist, 
who used his skills in the extinct Amorite language of Ugaritic to shed light on the Old Testament. He was instrumental in the revision of the New International Version that produced gender neutral wording, wording and pronouns. Mark, you probably were not familiar with uh, Larry Walker. Uh, his name is familiar to me because I had a very good friend who was the world's premier scholar of Ugaritic, Anson Rainey, uh, was my introduction to uh, ancient Semitic languages. But the name John Pokinghorn, does, is that familiar to you? Um, no, I'm, I'm really sorry it's not, but I'm, I'm very fascinated by his career. And by the way, I did have, when I was, uh, did my graduate work in, in, uh, schol in biblical scholarship and rabbinic texts, uh, Ugaritic was very, was front and center as a very important, uh, language, uh, that in Akkadian as the Both basis. of them. So, yeah. Yes. My teacher whom I lived with when I was a student in Israel, in, in Jerusalem, uh, he was the author of the three-volume grammar of the Ugaritic language. I uh, started out as a Baptist preacher and went over there and got in, wow. intoxicated with uh, archaeology and the languages and uh, actually converted to Judaism, died just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Pokinghorn uh, was very, very prominent in uh, among people who were studying science and religion. And I've read a couple of his books, uh, a kind and gentle man who just uh, an enormous uh, command of uh, the literature in both of both of these worlds. And I, I really mourn his death, especially sure. from Washington, D.C., right there where you are, Mark. Sojourners, you may be familiar with Sojourners, a progressive oh, yeah. Christian advocacy organization started and led until very recently by Jim Wallace. I reported on that in the meeting house just a few months ago. Each March, in honor of Global Women's Month, which March is, they release a list of influential women shaping the church in 2021, women who are, quote, bringing us hope and inspiring us to action, end quote. This year, they named 11 including one Cuban, one Native American, one Latina, five African Americans, one Panamanian, one Costa Rican, and one queer American. The list was put together by Paola Cleghorn, who serves on the Sojourner staff as their coordinator for immigration and the Women and Girls campaign. Mark, I have to confess, I didn't read the names of, uh, of these 11, but I was not familiar with any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm really thrilled that these women who we would say are really on the margins of uh, perhaps uh, the visible church uh, are having uh, their voices heard and having an influence in the church. We certainly need it. Yes, there are bishops. Uh, I've worked with some bishops in the Methodist community. I was very pleased by the uh, by the bishop who stood up um, for her church um, in front of the White House in that in that momentous time yes. of of, uh, of of terrible uh, struggle down in downtown, right where I am, and um, you know these voices are just going to make things better and better because we the scientific evidence is that basically men and women think together when they think equally and when they influence each other in an honorable way, and that that's uh, it's just making us all smarter and better at survival, and I think better at ethics. Well, you know, religion in general, uh, uh, this is true of Judaism, C Christianity, and Islam, for the vast majority of their history have been dominated by male leaders. And um, the advent of female leaders, uh, certainly over the last century and uh, with intensity over the last 40 and 50 years, has been really, really good for uh every aspect of our faith and our church life, uh, the temple life, and I am really glad to see it. Finally, this story, I'm not sure where it's from, Jackson, Mississippi, maybe, Charlotte, North Carolina, perhaps, Fort Mill, South Carolina, which is just south of Charlotte, or perhaps Moravian Falls, North Carolina. 
Or maybe it's Blue Eye, Missouri, not to be confused with Blue Eye, Arkansas, just one mile to the south, both of those towns in the Ozark Mountain. Somewhere, there comes the voice of the Pentecostal prophet, Rick Joyner, distributed by Pentecostal televangelist, Jim Baker, a name that we recognize, don't we? That voice is saying, quote, we have lost our country, and then he warns, it will be a civil war. It is time for Americans to stand up and push back against the evil that has overtaken our land, end quote. Wow. He was referring to President Biden, the Democrats, a stolen election, and the need to buy guns. To help explain this, you can buy their two-disc DVD set, of course, entitled The 13th Revelation Generation. I'm not sure where you need to send your money. One of those places. This is the craziness that's coming out of the Christian church, Mark. It undergirds this uh, pandemic of gun buying. It had a role in the attack on Congress on January the 6th. I don't know whether it influenced this young man down in Atlanta or, or not, but it's craziness, but it's part of the news. It's part of what we have to be aware of. It's crazy, isn't it, Mark? Well, I think that, uh, in fact, we know that the young man had a youth minister, and so he was evangelical, and he, he has, uh, the more that comes out about him is that he's not only, was not only disturbed in terms of his sexual addictions, but he had serious mis mis misogynistic fantasies, mm -hmm. and he was also religious. He was a member of, you know, he was, had a youth minister that was coaching him. So uh, it, it, this is not surprising. I mean, we have violence in the name of religion throughout history. It's just that we're a little bit surprised that the secularization of the church, the way in which the church is militarized now, and that's something that that is, um, you know, people people claim that they're going back to the real authentic Christianity, but in many ways they're secularizing it for the sake of political and military and financial gain. And that's exactly when religions throughout history end up um, deteriorating. And so it's a it's a real question of uh, competing here for an authentic Christian voice uh, when these things happen. You know, it's a strange thing. There is a lot of violence in the Bible, as you know, uh, both Testaments. Um, as a matter of fact, the central events in the Bible, both the exodus of Egypt is surrounded by death, and of course the crucifixion of Jesus is itself a, uh, a death. Um, uh, and both of these violent deaths. And uh, so trying to understand how our, our religions um, can flourish as peaceful movements when right at the center of things that we hold dear are really violent acts is a, is a, a struggle that we all have. Uh, we, we have to come to terms with it and understand it, don't you think? I think, that, I think that we have to realize that the way in which we interpret and understand the, our sacred scriptures is very much depending upon our our moral character and our stat and our, our our ability to examine ourselves. It's very easy to put on God, what in fact is our own problems. So you, if you're not self-examined enough, you can read your own violence, your own anger, your own misogyny, uh, into into the Bible. It doesn't mean that there isn't violence in the Bible, but the overarching message from the beginning of Genesis, uh, in the Old Testament to the last book is that violence doesn't pay, is that there is a Garden of Eden and you mess it up when you can't control yourself, when you can't control your impulses exactly like this man could not, when you can't control your, your, your anger and jealousy, which it, this man could not, just like Cain could not, and just like the generation of Noah could not. So the, really, the lessons are right there, but you have to be very self-examined in order to face yourself and not blame things on, on God or scripture. You know, let's go over this recent event down in Atlanta. 
this 21 year old man um, went out this week and bought a gun. That's my understanding. And then uh, went to these massage parlors. And I'm a little confused about whether he had been to these places before. Uh, I think uh, some of the news has said yes, that he had been to these places. He was familiar with them. But in any event, they seemed to uh, play into his sexual addiction in some way. Is, is that your understanding of it? That's, that's what I've read. That's what I've I, read, that he, he was struggling with this and that he, he did frequent these places and then, and then he just snapped. Uh, you know, Jesus told us that when we have a problem like he's got, we weren't supposed to hurt somebody else, but he famously said, to, you know, cut off your hand or uh, poke out your eye in order to keep yourself from sinning. But this man flipped all that around and instead of controlling himself or uh, reining himself in, he took out his uh, frustration and his anger on the women, the, inno the innocent women. What is this about? Well, I think it's easy to get lost in the issue of sexual addiction here and not see that he is part of a pattern in the United States right now of massive availability of, uh, of, of automatic weapons mm -hmm. together with the rage in the soul of a young white man young teenagers, the, from Columbine to Dylan Roof. I mean, there's a there's a pattern here of rage. The, the and, Pittsburgh uh, Synagogue? Yes. Uh, the uh, Sun, Sunderland, Texas, where he went into the church on Sunday morning? Yes. Right. So we have a, you know, sometimes the rage is directed at a certain race, sometimes a certain religion, uh, very often women. And it all suggests that we have a crisis among some young men who have who, who are really should have there should be mental health tests before they can buy heavy weaponry if anybody should buy heavy weaponry and uh, we have a crisis of that i think it's a spiritual crisis and instead of instead of ex instead of working on that crisis the kind of uh, the kind of preacher that you just described is fomenting it they're they're actually channeling that rage of of some of these white young men into acts of enormous mass violence so we have this crisis that we have to ask ourselves what would be the antidote to that what is the opposite uh and that's what i've struggled with it's what I, I i i teach and work on are the habits of compassion the habits of handling your grievances through communication and that's where we're we have to do a lot better in this country on all of those um, habits um, before we allow uh, these killings to continue unabated. Well, you're a rabbi, I'm an ordained minister, and so the role of religious communities in the lives of these young white men is of great concern to me. And I think about my own ministry, uh, what did I preach and what did I say uh, how did I counsel in ways that could have fed into this um, this uh, this whole pattern that you have described of all of these young men um, who uh, sometimes use guns and sometimes they don't, um, but fuel their frustration, their anxiety into violence. Um, and I wonder what it is about our churches, or are these anomalies? Uh, are these just a rare exceptions to the case? Well, uh, I think that we're also seeing, uh, I mean, rage is uh, sells a lot of television. It does. Uh, so we're talking about a tiny minority that actually pick up automatic weapons and shoot innocent people. But we're talking about a much larger bubble of people who have uh, channeled their rage through angry preachers or through angry talk show hosts. Right. And that that's that's the mix. That's the dangerous mix that if you would want to stop these mass murders and these domestic terrorist events, 
you would have to address the fact that rage sells so much. You would have to give some sort of competitive antidote. And, and we have to keep in mind that this rage, this murderous rage, is also suicide. Because very often this is about giving up the life that you have. And we know, we understand much better when people commit crimes based on poverty, based on desperation. And they, they steal a car or they rob a bank. And we know what that is. We, we know about jobs. We know about about people not ending up having to feed their family by stealing something. That's, that's a one kind of violence that we have, and we have a lot of it, and, and we have to work on that separately. But the suicide murder and destruction of family, that's a giving up on life. That's a nihilism that the church and the religious communities have to face, that if this is nihilistic, what are we doing wrong that they can't find meaning and love and hope and compassion for themselves and others and instead are finding rage and murder and suicide. That's, a, that's something every church has to examine. What's the messaging? How are we caring for young people? How can we bring them towards the, the light and away from this very dark, very dark uh, um, suicidal rage? You know, all of my life, all of my adult life as a white Baptist in the American South, all of my adult life, uh, I've heard the language of culture war in which religious leaders have invoked the vocabulary of war and aggression and the military in order to motivate really voters uh, to address what they see uh, is the direction of the country that's bad. They see it as, as bad. And so um, they're uh, one of the most popular phrases in uh, white evangelicalism is this phrase, prayer warriors. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it's meant as um, describing a person of intense spirituality who's going to pray a lot. But just pulling into our religious vocabulary, the word warriors, like the word culture war, or we're doing battle for, for God, has shaped, it seems to me, a whole generation of people who, who interpret what's going on in the world, what's going on in our country, in our states, in, um, in such dramatic, polarizing uh, demonizing language. And uh, I just wonder what role this plays in giving people permission to act as a warrior like they did on January 6th. I, I think that's a very, very deep comment that's supported both by spiritual traditions and by science. In the science realm, psycholinguistics is a field. It's a very important field. And psycholinguistics, uh, George Lakoff, work recently retired from Berkeley. Basically, psycholinguistics says that every word that you say has a biochemical impact My. on your brain and which way it is going. And where, where the, and to use the war language. See, I, I know a lot of military folks. I know a lot of people in the police. They don't use the war language. They don't do it. Because they know the power that they carry when they, when they carry a gun in the name of the law of how treacherous it is to be overreactive and to take a life and so when the, the chiefs that i work with and others they don't use warrior language warrior language is a very aggressive dangerous thing for the brain and the other thing is that the the bible didn't didn't do that the bible focuses on being anav the hebrew word is anav a uh, humble before god a chassid means means righteous and compassionate before That's god there's many different ways to phrase the righteousness, but not warriorship. That, that's something, and as a matter of fact, in the Exodus story, it says that God is the warrior here, which many interpretations over the past couple thousand years meant that it's not your job, but fate, history, nature is going to take its revenge on people like Pharaoh who have taken too much and hurt too many people. That's a very, that's, it's not for us to take that revenge. It's for, it's for God through nature, through the laws of history, 
and that's 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 where war might be, but not me. And of course, you know. uh, Jesus acted out this uh, this principle which you just said, uh, which he refused to resist uh, violence to his his own own person, and that Hebrew text that you cited, uh, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, is not quoted. Yours. <laughs> it's not yours. <laughs> it's not mine. Uh, it belongs to the Lord. We should leave it in, in the Lord's hands. Right. Uh, that's quoted, of course, in the Christian scriptures. And um, at least once, if not twice in the New Testament. Um, People so, interpret that as passivity. But there are other biblical verses that say, tzedek, tzedek, terdof. In Deuteronomy, pursue, pursue justice. Yes. So you're not supposed to be passive, but you're also, it's not, vengeance is a dangerous thing that the Bible was constantly warning against. But justice, yeah, pursue justice, but pursuit is not a violent word. It just means be proactive. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, the, one of the most popular verses over the last 20 or 30 years in in the Christian world is the Micah phrase to do justice, yeah. which is what you're referring to right now, to love mercy right. and to walk humbly. Uh, I, I can't think of a single verse that I see more uh, alluded to and quoted and referenced and interpreted more than this single verse. Mm -hmm. And uh, it encapsulates exactly what you're saying. Um, leave the vengeance to God if if there is to be any violence, uh, but we are to be humble, to be merciful, and to act in just ways. Right. Very, very true. So it makes you wonder, you know, it makes me want to go down to this Baptist church in Atlanta where this young man went to church. I don't want to blame the church for what he's done. I, I don't think we can do that, but it would be so interesting to study uh, the hymns that they sang. There are hymns with militaristic uh, language in them. To listen to sermons, uh, to look at the books that they're, they're reading and see what role this kind of imagery and vocabulary played in his uh, spiritual formation. We're, we're very interested. We've done a lot of research on the religious foundations of those who saved uh, people a, a, in the Holocaust mm -hmm. at the risk of their lives, the Huguenots in, uh, in uh, southern France in the city of Le Chambon, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, texts matter, and texts in the hands of preachers matter a great deal to mm -hmm. young minds. And so that's why I, I said before that the, you know, the Bible, there's a reason why the Bible always focused on the sin of cursing. People think that taking God's name in vain is simply about disrespecting God. Well, it is that, but it's also more than in the ancient world, using God's name to curse people was a form of power. It was a form of violence. And so the Bible was very clear, don't use God to kill people. Don't use God's name. Don't use your words to kill. And so that meant that your every word that comes out of you should be words that are nonviolent. We've even seen psychosocial research on parenting and and the parents that ha that never use a, a, a violent word. They, they don't have violent kids. They, they find other ways to discipline. They find other ways to guide away from from bad things. But they they simply don't even use those negative words. So it's very th psych like I said, psycholinguistics, I think, has uh, deep origins in in biblical attention to blessings. The power of blessing versus the danger of cursing. The power of blessing versus the danger of cursing. And I, I go back and read the text of this uh, news item that I read. We've lost our country. It will be a civil war. Uh, it's time to buy guns. It's time to stand up and push back against the evil that has overtaken the land. Uh, this is such drastic and dramatic and dangerous rhetoric. And uh, while the preacher behind the microphone may not uh, may be the most uh, calm and uh, placid of personalities, this kind of vocabulary can stir up people 
uh, to ungodly things. Um, I certainly would like to have a private conversation with him <laughs> to see if, uh, if, because I think you do have to listen when people are very angry. But I also think that uh, b because we, we, look, there's a lot of people on the march and fighting for democracy here and to stay, save the democracy. And there are a lot of good people in the country doing very, very good things. And at the same time, we're going to have to sit with people who are this enraged. We're going to have to listen and we're going to have to figure out how to find a common ethical language, how to find a, a, a covenant the way that the Bible refers to. And, and uh, um, most people don't want it to be a civil war, but they're, they're inching in that direction. And then sometimes when a demagogic leader comes along, they just, they just go there. And that's very, very dangerous. But maybe we need also to reach out and figure out a way um, in private to uh, change their minds. You know, just this week, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the FBI came out with a report on internal terrorism. Yeah. And uh, the director of the FBI, I think, was uh, giving testimony before Congress this week about how the most serious internal threats we face are, are these angry, young, white men uh, who are hearing this violent language and they're buying these guns. Uh, I wrote, you know, I write a column every week. Uh, I'm going to read my column here in a minute, but I wrote two successive columns about a year ago calling for Christians to give up guns. Hmm. You know, there's a whole movement out there where Christians need to own guns and arm yourselves because the day of the Lord is coming but I think that one of the most Christian things that we can do uh, is to surrender the guns, give them up. Now, I, I have never been, I have never lived in a home where there were guns and uh, neither had my dad and uh, neither, neither my children. Uh, so I'm accustomed to living without guns and living without the need of a gun. And I just wonder that, you know, in my tradition, Mark, we have the altar call. Mm -hmm. You know what this is, you, you know, a la Billy Graham. It started many years before him, but it's the call to walk the aisle and surrender something. And yeah. uh, I'll have to tell you, I've dreamed many times of, of turning the altar call, having people bring their guns and lay them on the altar. Wow. Well, I, I, I can't think of a single uh uh, altar call more needed in America today than for the preachers to get up and say, bring your guns, put them on the table here and surrender them to God and let God protect us. It's a, it's a wonderful dream. It's certainly, uh, it's the most armed nation in the world. It is. And uh, by far, there's far more guns than there are people uh, at the same time. And there are Christians around the world, very devout Christians. Most Christians live in the Southern hemisphere. They don't have armed, they don't have no. arsenals in each home. And, uh, and we know the statistics on safety and that it, not only that, it, it not only does it not necessarily increase safety, but it actually endangers many people who are suicidal. That's most suicides come from guns. They do, uh, but I, um, I think that I think that what you're doing, Dwight, is a really good idea because you have to first have the vision, no matter how distant it seems from reality. Now, it is it is a problem that no religious visionaries are saying. Wouldn't it be ideal if we had far less of them? There's no question that thousands and thousands of people wouldn't have been killed, um, and that has nothing to do with uh, a, a good police force that can enforce the law uh, and be uh, armed sufficiently. Uh, but uh, it, this gets back to something, Dwight, that involves fear. Many people are saying that fear is the, is the key uh, uh, excessive feeling that especially uh, the white majority seems to feel at this point and white majority men. We have to explore that. We have to explore that as theologians, as pastors, as philosophers, uh, as psychologists and ask ourselves, well, what could undo that 
so that the guns were no longer this important. Uh, I do think, you know, I do think fear is a problem. And, you know, as a scholar of the Bible, it's often said, often quoted that the, the command do not fear is the most oft repeated command in the Bible. Yeah. And uh, and yet there is this fear and I, it, it's rife in the political culture that we have. And I'll have to say that uh, progressives and liberals, they fear uh, what could happen to the country if it were overrun by conservatives. Conservatives fear what will happen to our country if it's led and dominated by the progressives. And this kind of language is stirred up on both sides mm -hmm. as a way to motivate voters yes. uh, and to demonize people who vote uh, red or vote blue. Um, but the long-term impact of that is to teach us to fear our citizens and in many cases, family members who vote a different color. Uh, and this cultivates the fear that we have, well, what is our country coming to? And uh, uh, it, you know, we're going to lose it to use the, the language that this man, uh, this uh, preacher out there somewhere said. Um, and I do think fear is a big problem. We have um, to, we have to ask, sit with somebody like that and say, what is your deepest fear? Yeah. What is it that you would be willing to take on arms and have a civil war where hundreds of thousands or millions would die what is, what is the fear? And then see if we can come to a place of acknowledging that fear and say, well, how can we work that with that? How can, yeah. how can we make everyone feel safe? Because there's only one group buying guns when they're afraid. I mean, I, I live in a suburban area. The suburban area has far higher crime rates than many rural areas. And, and yet the gun sales are very, very robust in places that have kind of low crime rates. So what is the fear? And if we name it and talk about it neighbor to neighbor across lines, might, might that not help to dispel uh, this terror? Are people afraid that if the country becomes majority people of color, that somehow there's going to be revenge for all of the slavery? Is that the fear? Is there a fear of, of people of color? Let's talk about it. Let's Let's talk about it because I mean I work deeply with with the with the black community in North Carolina. As a matter of fact, I'm I have a deep deep uh, friendships in Charlotte. We're working on a commission, on a reconciliation commission, an atonement commission. But that means every day, I have wonderful relationships between black and white Christians in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Beautiful relationships. But a lot of people don't. They're just sitting there stewing. And then they have a demagogue on the radio mm -hmm. that says to them that there's a race war coming, better buy a weapon. So we're, we're letting them be terrified instead of openly engaging in a way that we could be honest about these things. And that's, that's where, where our, our, our pastoral work, our ethical work, and, and our spiritual and psychosocial work should come together. No. And that's why Mark, your program, what you do in your program is so important. I hope we can reach. Yes. When, when you read off uh, the list of professions that you and I share, uh, we said, you said as theologians and pastors and uh, scholars, I wanted to add and radio host <laughs> to, to your list right there. Right. Uh, Mark, I wrote a column last week about some of this. I called it the conversion of a white man. And you were talking about your um, partnerships and collaborations with uh, black Christians uh, down in Charlotte, which is uh, just a couple of uh, hours from where I am. I'm going over there tomorrow, as a matter of fact, to pick up my grandson, who uh, has the great Hebrew name of Samuel. Mm. And uh, fact is his, his other grandfather is a very active uh, and practicing Jew. Uh, I'm, and I took Sam to my, the synagogue down in Brunswick, Georgia uh, last year. And um, we went to the service and you know how uh, after uh, the service is over, uh, Jews gather in the fellowship hall for some food. Mm -hmm. We gather around the table and they say the, the, the blessing. Correct. Right. And of course I was shocked 
when my then 11 year old grandson repeated in the loudest voice in the fellowship hall, the prayer in Hebrew. <laughs> I was quite proud of him and thrilled that he was growing up uh, influenced by both uh, the Jewish uh, faith in the, in the synagogue and the Christian faith in the Methodist church where his uh, grandmother takes him. But I wrote a column last week about my, the conversion of a white man, about my journey. Uh, uh, my journey, I want to say into wokeness, as they say, I actually started in Pittsburgh in 1982 when several black families joined our uh, all white uh, Baptist church there. And, um, and then over the last 10 years, of, as I've gotten involved with so many, many, many uh, young black preachers, especially and uh, black scholars, uh, it has just uh, shifted everything in my, uh, in my soul. And uh, the way I understand things, uh, the way I read things, uh, the way I see things, the way I hear things. And I think about so many people who still live in such lily white in environments and haven't had the rich um, journey that I, f I feel like I, I, I've had. Um, well, after COVID, we're going to, uh, my wife and I are going to be in Charlotte a lot because of uh, Dr. Rodney Sadler and Dr. Sheldon Shipman. I would love to introduce you to uh, former mayor, uh, Jennifer Roberts, just a wonderful community of leaders there and, and spiritual pastors, uh, Christian pastors, some from the AME church, some Baptist, uh, and I think you would love them. I, I would like to do this very much. Let's make yeah. a date on this. You call me or email me uh, when you're coming down this way, and I'll plan to be over there. I'll do a show from, I'll take the meeting house to Charlotte. Uh, that would be wonderful. It would be good to have a, a, a group session. That's right. Uh, that we could broadcast live. Uh, uh, I would I would really like to, to do that. I might even invite my my young sam to sit beside me he's been on the show several times oh good and yeah he's uh he's a, a a sharp sharp young man mark it's always great to talk to you you inspire me uh you've got a book coming out tell me about it oh the book is from oxford university press it's about my eighth it's called compassionate reasoning uh, uh changing the mind to change the world wow and it's a deep exploration of of our of ethical schools of thought about how you make decisions. It's about the neuroscience of compassion and how it works in the brain. And it's a parallel to, it's, it's, it's merging that with public health and medicine and how we can make policies and find out how to deal with difficult issues in family and in society with compassion training at the center together with moral reasoning. And that's, uh, yeah, so I'm very excited. I mean, you, you're covering the whole horizon there, aren't you, Mark? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm very excited because I'm also, um, I'm very tired of science being here and religion being there. Yeah. And I'm very, I'm very committed to uh, a lot of the scientists that, that do this stuff, they're great, but they're kind of afraid of religion. And so they kind of leave yeah. out you know, half the population. So this is a book to merge the wisdom of of the science and ethics together with uh, the wisdom of traditional religions too. Well, we, we talked a few minutes ago about John Polkinghorne who merged the physical science yes. uh, with his uh, Anglican uh, religious c community. Here you are working more with uh, what we could, would call the social sciences yeah. and uh, and um, well, this is the great undiscovered country. Right oh, there. sure. Right there. I, I agree. Uh, mine is uh, I don't even understand mine, let alone yours. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, maybe uh, a book like this will bring you to the attention of the Templeton people. Uh, this is out. Of, this is uh, out of Philadelphia and uh, where they uh, give these prizes to people who are working at the intersection of yeah. science and faith. And you are certainly doing that. Uh, when is the book to be published? 
I, I handed in the, uh, the final copies, but you know, there's editing and such. So uh, Oxford hasn't told me, I don't know how many months, but it'll be out with it. I'm, I'm sure within a half a year. Okay, great, great. Well, you let me know when it, when it comes out, we'll do another show and I'll, I'll, I'll read it and review it and uh, put it on the meeting house. Mark, Thank you so blessings much. on you. Uh, we've Thank got uh, Passover and Easter coming up. Yes. Uh, the great um, reservoir of spir spiritual um, uh, virtues and um, graces that we need for our world and our own lives. Isn't that right? Yes. It's a wonderful time. And uh, looking forward to some Passover seders with my family over Zoom and a little bit in distancing on a roof in downtown. <laughs> so we'll <have> a good <laughs> time. Uh, uh, have you gotten your shot yet, Mark? <laughs> um, I gotten one, so yeah. I have another one coming. So we'll uh, just trying to be patient. <laughs> I, I'm, and I'm trying to not only be patient, but stay to myself, you know, and yeah. uh, not get out and roam, roam around. Right. Well, blessings on you. And um, thank you I, so much. It was wonderful to be here. It's, 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 it's been great. Thank you, Mark. I'll be back in just a minute. This is The Meeting House. I'm your host, Dwight A. Moody. I'll be back in just uh, a, a second with my commentary for the week entitled Trading for Trump. It's trading season for athletes, as you know. In the NBA, teams are beefing up their rosters for the playoffs. NFL teams making news every day, retooling their lineups, hoping to make a run to the Super Bowl this fall. Southern Baptists, which is my heritage from long ago, are also in a trading frenzy, it seems, and for good reason. They're in a decades-long slump in membership and money. It crested in 2019 when they registered the largest one-year decline in their history. My, but that's not all. Things are not good in the clubhouse. Popular theologian Russell, Russell Moore, whom I really like, he's on shaky ground with the players. He leads the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. His advocacy on certain issues of public policy have not been well received in the dugout, we might say. A recent report blamed him for significant decline in congregational and convention revenue. Then there's an organization known as The Network. They're calling out what they see as, quote, liberalism in the Southern Baptist organization. They're threatening an outright takeover of the whole team. Calvinism, it's still in play. Just below the surface of civility is a long festering resentment about the creeping dominance of Calvinistic ideology. But perhaps the most consequential dynamic is the threatened rebellion of the franchise teams, what they call the new state conventions in places outside of the South, like California and Dakota and Pennsylvania, where I worked. The mission board adopted a policy not too long ago, of bypassing the state organizations as they funnel Southern Baptist mission money to projects in those states and regions. The minor league players, we might say, are not happy. So these Baptists, looking to trade up, as they say in the business, rolled the dice. They swapped 
two longtime superstars for one questionable performer. Beth Moore is one of those stars. For decades, she has been the most influential female in the fan base. She also is the most lucrative author published by their in-house publishing firm. But Ms. Moore of Houston has been increasingly vocal in her displeasure with her church team. They were not, it seems, taking seriously the concerns of the largest fan base, the women. Inspired by the Me Too movement, the women called for more transparency and more action on behalf of sexual abuse victims. She finally said, and here I paraphrase her, I can't play with this team anymore. Another superstar on the trading block also hails from Houston. He's the famous and influential pastor of the mega church known as Church Without Walls, the Reverend Dr. Ralph West. When SBC team leaders announced last fall that Black Lives Matter and critical race theory are contrary to the Bible and team doctrine, he voiced his discontent this way. So just trade me. The discontent of Moore and West are the public responses of influential players to the failure of the SBC managers to address concerns of race and gender. But heeding their calls was a losing strategy, the coaches surmised. So, to no one's surprise, they traded those two loyal players, Moore and West, for what they saw as a rising star, Donald J. Trump. It's a gamble, as everyone sees. Whether it'll play off, pay off will take years to assess. But Southern Baptist had a problem. And trading two restless stars from Houston for a popular slugger from Palm Beach just might produce what they think they need. More butts in the pews, more dollars in the till. Regardless, it will go down in history as the biggest trade in recent religious history. Whether it slows the decline of the once proud organization known as the Southern Baptist Convention remains to be seen. I'll keep you posted. I'm Dwight Moody in the Meeting House. I'll be back in just a minute. Thank you for stopping by The Meeting House today. I'm your host, Dwight A. Moody. Visit our website at themeetinghouse.net. You can subscribe to the newsletter. I need some new subscribers. I had three people unsubscribe this week, including a member of my own family. I'm going to take him off my Christmas card list. You can read all the commentaries, including this one and the one last week that I referred to, lots of book reviews, you can listen to all the podcasts. Every show is turned into a podcast and placed on the podcast page. You can join our circle of 70. I wish you would. I'm seeking 70 people to be donors to the Meeting House. We're trying to expand our reach and our, our distribution. As you know, just three weeks ago, we launched this uh, television version of the Meeting House in collaboration with the St. Stephen's Church Live TV ministry out of Louisville, Kentucky. I chose 70 as my goal because that's my age for just two more weeks. We have almost, uh, well, a little over 20 who have become members of the Circle of 70. You can become a member. We need your support. Go to the support page on the Meeting House. It'll tell you how you can give online. It'll give you the address where you can send a check and you can keep those cards and letters coming. Thank you for listening today. Thanks to Everett Armstrong in the studio in Georgia, to engineer Alex Mattingly in Louisville. Join us next week. Until then, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly, wear a mask, sing a song, get a vaccine, buy some coffee.
join the circle of 70, give up your guns, be kind to everyone. I'm Dwight Moody in the Meeting House. Have a great day.